This and every episode of the Brewlosophy Podcast is brought to you by the American Homebrewers Association, a member-driven organization that wants to help you save money on beer and brewing supplies. In addition to providing brewing resources and hosting one-of-a-kind events, the AHA offers money-saving discounts at nearly 2,000 beery destinations around the country through their Member Deals program. Join the AHA at homebrewersassociation.org and make your beer money go further. For many brewers, the mere thought of any microbe other than cultured ale or lager yeast is enough to send shivers down their spine, while bacteria and wild yeast are what other brewers are all about, using them to create unique beers that are tart, funky, and delicious. Now, traditionally, sour beers would take quite a bit longer than the typical two to four weeks to make a clean beer. However, many brewers these days are utilizing methods to hasten the souring time. You're listening to the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott, and joining me on this very special episode is Brewlosophy contributor Malcolm Fraser, as well as our very first in-studio guest, my friend Sean Wood, who helps to manage the sour program at House of Pendragon Brewing Company here in Fresno. Uh, Sean, thanks for coming on the show, man. You guys are doing some incredible stuff with sour beers. Hey, Marshall. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. So tell us a little bit about your role at House of Pendragon and, and how you got kind of into the whole souring thing over there. Okay, yeah. It was uh, about November of 2016, Tommy uh, Caprillion, he's the owner, brewmaster of House Pendragon here in Fresno. Uh, brewery is actually in Sanger, California. Uh, yeah, November 2016, he contacted me. Uh, he approached me. Um, I was just a home brewer at the time. Uh, had a little bit of experience with some sours, and he said, uh, hey, why don't you come over and help us get the uh, sour program off the ground? And you know, just started doing some experiments there at the brewery and, and found out what worked for us and moved from there. Yeah, you guys are kicking ass. And, um, you know, every time I go into the tap room, which I'm lucky enough to live a block away from, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, which I know you don't, man, you're cross town. But you uh, there's it always seems like there's something new, something exciting. I was just in there Friday night drinking a farmhouse, a sour farmhouse ale. And there was like two versions of it on both of them. Amazing. Both of them higher alcohol than I expected at first. Yeah, I had a rough Friday night, um, but yeah, you're doing great things. If I recall correctly, um, one of the one of the ways, one of the first things that you helped Tommy do was like culture some wild yeast off of fruit. Right, right, yeah. So Tommy actually, so he he grew up in Sanger, California. It's a very agriculture centered uh, uh, town and, and, and area. And so he grew up on the family farm, working the farm. So he he grew up on a farmhouse. He's very passionate about farmhouse beers. So uh, one of the things that he had me do, yeah, we went out to the farm. We picked some fruit. Uh, I think we picked some plums, some peaches, some apricots, some grapes. And uh, then I, yeah, went uh, went through kind of uh, isolated some. I wouldn't say isolated. I collected. Uh, some wild yeast. So uh, it, it was kind of, it was a long process. I played it out, put it under a microscope. Pretty sure we got some wild sack and uh, made some pretty fun beers with that. Yeah. yeah, dude. Super cool project. I think something a lot of homebrewers. Malcolm, have you ever cultured wild yeast from uh, from fruit or, or something else in your backyard? Yeah, I've made some cool ships and done some experiments with uh, kettle geometry for altering cooling rates and stuff, but uh, not directly from fruit per se. I've done leaves. And I've done like natural capture from, you know, dust motes or whatever's in the air. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's, I, I tried one time. We'll talk a little bit about my uh, my failed attempt uh, later. But yeah, I'm excited to to talk quick souring with you guys. I've got a little bit of experience doing it myself. Not much. I know that's why I wanted to have Malcolm on with you, Sean, because I think you guys know the language a bit better than I do. Um, but before we get to tart, Ed, if you will. <laughs> oh my gosh. Hey, it was, dude. I mean. <laughs> I, <laughs> no, I'm go not with a comedian it. by trade. Let's pretend that didn't happen. Just oh. go. go. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank everyone who's been using our links to do their online shopping. It really has been helping us out a ton. Uh, if you like what we're doing and you want to help us to keep doing it, head over to brewlosophy.com slash support where you'll find a list of links uh, to bookmark and use whenever you do your shopping online. If you want to be rewarded for your support, you can become a patron of Brewlosophy by uh, pledging a small monthly contribution. In return, you'll receive things like access to the Brew Crew private forum, secret contributor recipe, 
recipes, unique discounts at Yakima Valley Hops, and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A with a very special guest. Just a couple days ago, BJCP Grandmaster Judge Gordon Strong joined us from Brazil, which was really neat, uh, and spent an hour answering questions uh, from patrons. It was super cool, very educational. Uh, Coming up next month is blogger and New England IPA expert Scott Janish, a friend of the show, really cool guy. Uh, He's not only working on a new IPA-focused book, but he's also opening Sapwood Cellars with partner Michael Tonsmeyer, who we had on a couple months ago. Uh, So if you're into IPA, especially the hazy variety popular right now, uh, you don't want to miss this Q&A session. Scott's done more actual research of the style than anybody I know. It's going to be a good one. Head over to patreon.com slash brewlosophy to learn about the rewards you can get for helping us out. If you haven't already registered for HomebrewCon yet, you unfortunately missed the early bird pricing. However, tickets are still available. Go register now. It'll be the best brewing decision you make all year, I promise. You need to be, you need to be an AHA member to register, and you can sign up at brewlosophy.com slash AHA or homebrewersassociation.org. For those who are going, we still have some spots open for our annual, it's really our just our second annual, Brewlosophy karaoke party. Uh, it's going to be wild. You don't. You won't be forced to sing or anything like that. Just hang out, drink beer, and party with dorks like us. Uh, if you're interested, shoot me an email, Marshall at Brewlosophy.com, and I'll get you the details on how to make your donation uh, early so that you can secure your spot on the guest list. If you are a lover of hops like us and you need something to do on September 29th, consider heading up to the hop capital of the world, Yakima, Washington, to attend the 16th annual Fresh Hop Ale Festival with us. A few of us are going to be heading to Yakima the last weekend of September to hang out with folks from Yakima Valley Hops and attend the festival. I'm really excited for this, not only because Yakima during uh, hop harvest is really the place to be, but I've heard great things about the festival as well. Okay, time for some feedback, which this week is brought to you by our friends from Imperial Yeast, who are providing professionals and homebrewers alike with the finest quality yeast on the market. Packing 200 billion cells into each pitch right pouch, brewers are ensured a quick and healthy fermentation. All of us here at Brewlosophy have been using Imperial Yeast for a while now and have nothing but super positive experiences with it. With a wide range of ale and lager strains, as well as some funkier stuff, uh, Imperial Yeast is sure to have what you require to turn your wort into delicious beer. Go check out everything Imperial has to offer. Offer at imperialyeast.com today. All right. First bit of feedback comes from Dan Mullins, who lives in Phoenix, Arizona. He wrote in to say, I just finished the episode on gelatin, and while we've been using it since the experiment with great results, we've tried adding it to a beer over 50 degrees Fahrenheit. I think what he's saying is the beer was warmer than 50 degrees uh, three or four times and have had good and have never had good results. We mentioned in that show that well, I've heard from people who have had good results doing that. So he says every time uh, was with Safel USO5 and ales, so maybe that played into it. I'm curious what types of beers and yeast folks are getting good results putting gelatin into warmer beers. Um, I, I don't know. I, either of you have any thoughts on that? No, I don't, I don't do it much, man. I, I do cold beer. Uh, I've, yeah, I, I'm sure I've done it. I just don't recall. Yeah, I've never added it to war- beer warmer than about 40 degrees, really. Um, I'm usually adding it after like you know 18 hours at, at 32 degrees in the, in the fermentation chamber. Uh, I think I gelatined an IPA once. I uh, was using Cal Ale Yeast 01. Um, and it, I had poor results. So that was my one time. Okay. I, I don't think it works well over whatever I was at. It was maybe around 65. Yeah. I, I, I can't help but wonder if the positive results from people who have emailed me to say that it works when they find warm um, isn't, you know, if that beer might not have just cleared up on its own anyways. Uh, but they're not sharing, I, you know, Dan, I can't, I, I can't say what yeasts or or grists are being used in those beers because they're not sharing that with me i've just heard you know feedback from people who say it works um you know i'd imagine you use something like um you know pub ale from imperial the fuller strain um in in in, in a bitter it's probably going to clear up pretty quickly anyway so whether you use the gelatin or not so i really don't know um that said my experience with us05 with the wlp001 with flagship from imperial that's all said to be sourced from you know sierra nevada is that it's a pretty poor flocculator it doesn't necessarily drop clear easily anyways and so uh, i've noticed that sometimes beers fined with gelatin uh, that are fermented with that particular strain do sometimes take a little bit longer to clear up anyways so Next bit of feedback comes from Brad Willis, uh, or I'm sorry, Brad Willens from Apex, North Carolina. He says, dude, dude, (laughs) I just have to say the Jersey and Tim segment really threw me for a loop the first time I heard it. I was almost put off. 
but it's become one of my favorite segments of the show. The best part, noticeable, noticeable particularly in the last couple of episodes, has been hearing their palettes develop, even if just a little bit, and I promise you, Brad, it's just a little bit, um, and naming some flavor nuances of what they are tasting. I laugh my ass off every time now. Thanks for the entertainment. We've got ourselves a Jersey and Tim fanboy, and, mm. I, and I'm happy for that. Do you a fan of Jersey and Tim? Uh, yeah, I, I would like to call myself a fanboy of this as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah and you know them personally. You, you actually know Jersey and Tim. Um, Malcolm, I know, you know, this was one of those things. When we decided to put Jersey and Tim on the show and, and start this segment, it was kind of like a toss-up between us, you know, contributors. Uh, uh, should we do it? Should we not do it? I don't know. And, uh, but I feel like it's been a, a great success. I, I really highly enjoy uh, their reviews, yes. Yeah, I think it's fun. So people who don't think it's fun, you know, stop being a curmudgeon. <laughs> en- enjoy yourself a little bit. It's okay to laugh. Yeah. You. you know, their, their, their segment is only, it's literally only one minute. You know, the, the, the length of their review is literally in the song. And it's also hilarious. And, you know, I think that, <laughs> I think that people, there are people out there who just don't like to laugh. And hey, listen, if you don't like it, skip over it. You know, you're not hurting our feelings and we're not intending to hurt yours. So, uh, well, thanks for the feedback, Dan and Brad. If you have feedback for the show, you can send it to feedback at brulosophy.com or phone it in at 951-444-0320. All right. Speaking of Jersey and Tim, homebrewer Ryan Rupp sent me a bottle of a stout he made in which he added a hefty dose of coffee. Ryan explained he was intending to make an oatmeal stout, but his homebrew shop was out of oatmeal. So he tripled down on the chocolate malt instead and ended up making what he thought was one of his better stouts. What would the boys think? One minute beer review with Jersey and Tim. Ready for this? We got a dark one. Here. It's a dark one. It's dark. Gonna be a dark beer. Just let it burn. Stir from stir. Coffee aroma. Dark beer is a fifty percent chance it's gonna coffee aroma. It's a coffee stout or oatmeal. Oatmeal or coffee? Ooh, coffee and oatmeal. Definitely coffee taste. I haven't tasted it yet, but I bet it's coffee and oatmeal with a tinge of oatmeal and coffee. We're done. That's it. It's over. <laughs> nope. I'm gonna take a sip of this one because I like the dark beers. I like it. Delicious. It's pretty much coffee. It's delicious. It's very good. Mm. It's not too much. It doesn't do too much. I'm trying to do too much. Dude, it's like I'm going to do one thing. I'm going to be a dark beer. Really good dark beer. If you keep drinking like the second and third taste. Is there, is there more going on in there? Yeah. Is there more in there? We go deeper into the Narnia closet. You're right. There are mysteries to be discovered and legends to be found. I got a little metallic. Oh, that's good. I do like it. Dude, that is good. I'm not going to go so far as to say I know what style it is. I have no idea. But it's delicious. I think it's a beer style. Yeah, it's definitely beer. Mm. Ah, it's not too much. It's just easy on you. Yeah. It's like, dude, take it easy, man. You've had a rough night of reviewing beers. Just, just, just lay back. Enjoy just it. Back enjoy enjoy one. this. Here yeah, you go. Take it, it go. easy on you. Well, hey. I, <laughs> <laughs> so, so what I think is hilarious about this one is that they... Oh, my they, gosh. Yeah. So Tim and Jersey had no clue what they were drinking other than the way it looked. <laughs> And within the first, what, 10 seconds, Jersey nailed it. They was like, it immediately. And he had no idea. He hadn't even tasted it yet. He just started saying oatmeal and coffee. Uh, I mean, you know, to, to go along with that last, that last uh, point of feedback. They're grown up before our very eyes. They are growing I up mean, before our eyes. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they were just little tiny Jerseys and Tim's, could barely taste the beer. Yeah, yeah. It had, it had, to, be, it had to be like PBR and Fireball. Right, and now, right. I mean, now look at these guys. Yeah. You know what? They're going to be BJZB Grandmaster Judges here soon. <laughs> we're, we're doing God's work. <laughs> we people. are doing God's work. Well, I love coffee and I love beer, but I'm not really a huge fan of blending them together. With that said, I have to admit, Ryan's coffee stout was really quite tasty. Uh, Malcolm, you, you know, you and I have talked about how coffee stouts can have like a green pepper flavor to them. Um, that was absent in my, you know, in my perception at least of this beer when I was drinking it. Um, in addition to the typical roast and kind of obvious coffee flavors, it was very coffee forward. Uh, awesome. Yeah, yeah. So it was really good. I perceived an almost coffee-like bitterness that kind of like morphed into this smoothness as I drank it. It wasn't sharply bitter. It had what I enjoy, that kind of bitter character that I enjoy um, about coffee. So uh, yeah, good job, Ryan. I appreciate you sending that in. If you want your beer or any other fermented beverage you make, or feel like sending into us to review, uh, let me know. Uh, Jersey and Tim would love to review it for you. You can email me, marshall at brewlosophy.com, and we'll get you all set up. Uh, last bit, if you live anywhere near any of us, we'd love to get you involved as a participant. We've got contributors in Chicago, Illinois, Denver, Colorado, Pueblo, Colorado, Corona, Colorado, Atlanta, Georgia, and right here in Fresno, California. Just shoot me an email, marshall at brewlosophy.com, and I'll contact you with the contributor who lives closest to you. Stick around. We'll be right back.
When dumping wort-soaked grain in leftover low-gravity wort while cleaning up after a brew day, do you ever wonder what your true efficiency would be if that wort made its way to the kettle instead? Using the brew bag, a fabric filter for all mash tuns and brewing methods, allows you to capture every last drop of wort. Not only does this increase kettle efficiency, it lowers your grain bill, which saves you money. Throwing wort in the trash is like dumping a 12-pack down the drain and just doesn't make sense. Use the brew bag and leave no wort behind. I've been using these filters for a long time and recommend them to everyone. I never have to worry about a stuck sparge and cleanup is fast and easy. Go grab yourself a brew bag fabric filter at brewinabag.com and be sure to use code TBP17 at checkout to get a discount on your order. Compact and simple to use with a small footprint for brewing indoors, the Grainfather makes it easy for you to brew professional quality beers at home. The Grainfather is an all-in-one brewing system that lets you brew all-grain beer in a single compact stainless steel unit. It uses an electric heating element and pump to maintain a constant temperature and to circulate the wort during the mashing and cooling stages. It also comes with a counterflow chiller to reduce chilling times and produce high quality wort. And now, with the addition of their conical fermenter, the Grainfather takes things one step further by offering home brewers state-of-the-art temperature-controlled fermentation just like commercial breweries use. And with the Grainfather Recipe Creator and Connect app, you can easily design a recipe, sync your brewing system with your phone, and then just sit back and relax as the app takes over and assures that you maintain your scheduled mash temps and boil schedule. Head to Grainfather.com to purchase your all-in-one brewing system today and to sign up for their free recipe creator tool. Once more, head on over to Grainfather.com. That's Grainfather.com and get started today. Shopping for brewing supplies online can be a real hassle, which is why we recommend Love to Brew. They've got great prices, super fast shipping, and they carry exclusive products like East Coast Yeast, the Brewer's Essentials brand, and their award-winning beer recipe kits. They're also the only place you can pick up your very own Brewlosophy recipe kit. The numbers don't lie. Love to Brew has hundreds of five-star reviews and thousands of brewers are choosing them for their supplies and ingredients each year. Experience the difference at lovetobrew.com. That's love, the number two, brew.com. Well, I consider myself really fortunate right now. And Malcolm, I'm sorry for you, but Sean, you brought us in some beers to drink. Um, Looks like the one we're drinking now is called Genesis from House of Pendragon. Can you tell us a little bit about this beer? Yeah, so Genesis, it's a a sour Blondale. Uh, It's 5.5% ABV. Uh, The unique thing about this beer is uh, it's made with our house culture, which is uh, several strains of Britannomyces and a couple different strains of Lactobacillus. And this one... um, Interestingly enough, uh, almost just like a, a straight uh, starts out like a clean beer as, as far as wort production. Um, and we pitch our house culture and about a week and a half, two weeks in, we've we've got it sour. So uh, this one really? is not 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 the quick sour method per se. Like kettle souring. It's not necessarily right. that. Yeah. Right. But it, it gets sour quickly. Yeah. I would say. I mean, this is an assertively tart beer. It, it is like it, it perfectly, in my opinion. It's not, you know, sometimes, and, and for better or for worse, I think sometimes, but there are those beers that you drink, whether kettle soured or traditionally soured, that to me are kind of lacking in, the, in one character or another. This has obvious Britannomyces character. Yes, yeah. So uh, I was shooting for a blend or, or a balance of Brett Fruit and Brett Funk. Uh, along with the acidity. So, uh, you know, I love Britannomyces character, but I don't want it to go, f- to go too far one way or the other. Yeah. So was hoping for, in addition to some nice pineapple and citrusy flavors, also a little touch of earthy, spicy funk in the background. I'll take it, dude. Super good. Can't wait to finish this crawler while you and Malcolm talk. <laughs> <laughs> as far as I'm aware, quick souring is a relatively new thing uh, in brewing, relatively at least. Uh, something I only started to really notice in the last six or seven years Maybe even less than that. Uh, Sean, I know you've made your fair share of traditionally soured beers. I've tasted their delicious you know, on the homebrew scale. Um, how did you get started in quick souring? And you know what was it that kind of spurred your interest in that? Yeah, so like you were saying, I, when I was homebrewing, uh, traditional sour method, really because I didn't know anything else. And 
and uh, hadn't really experimented very much. So uh, was was brewing. Um, they were coming out okay. Uh, I think I could have done much better at the time. But the the reason I got into quick souring was when Tommy Caprillion approached me about working at the brewery and getting their sour br- uh, program up and running. He tasked me essentially with. Uh, you know, he, he said, can you turn these beers around in four to six weeks? Is that going to be a possibility? And I said, you know what? I, I have never done that before, but let me start experimenting and, and I'll see what I can do. So four to six weeks is what he, he tasked me with and uh, started reading up a little bit and, and doing a bunch of experiments and went from there. Well, I know there's a lot of there's a lot of techniques that get kind of uh implemented. I don't want to say that they're kind of bastardized, but there are things that that quick sour brewing requires that is a bit different than, um, you know, traditionally soured beers. Maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, traditionally soured beer is, is you're making a, a clean, essentially a clean base beer. And this might be different for different breweries, but essentially a clean base beer. And then you're moving, you know, from stainless or yeah, there's a hundred different ways to do it, you know, for hundred breweries, they're going to have their own way, but maybe the traditional method is, is primary and stainless and then go into barrels from there and then inoculate with your lactic acid bacteria, uh, Britannomyces from there. So the beer is, is either almost all the way attenuated or completely attenuated, then goes into barrels for, for long storage from there. So the quick souring method, you're essentially going in reverse. You're adding, you know, you're producing a wort, however you're producing that. There's a hundred different ways to do that again. But uh, you're essentially adding your lactic acid bacteria in the beginning of the fermentation process to let the either lactobacillus, pediococcus, whatever you're using, you're allowing it to access sugars uh, in the beginning to really do what it wants. You know, it's going to create uh, uh, acidity in the beginning and then you're going to ferment it um, with either Saccharomyces, Britannomyces after you create the acidity. Really, if you you go way back, so if you go back to like... uh some of the notes you can find from Kurt Marshall from the VOB or uh, uh, Brugard Martin or Bernhard Martin, sorry. Uh, there, there's evidence that people were doing like a, a, a mash, typically uh, multi levels of decoction, and then they would chill it down to like 114 ish uh, Fahrenheit, and then they would add various lacto pitches that they had maintained. Huh. And they would hold it. And the notes would say something pretty vague, like until desired acidity was reached. So people who have used El Bruckii know that it's slow acting. So we're not talking like 12 to, to 48 hours. You know, we're, we're talking probably days, you know, which is different than, than traditional kettle souring. So there is some evidence that it might have been done uh, either solely lactic or at least as a mix culture of lactic and sac. But they certainly weren't churning and burning like we do today. How far, how far back is that going, Malcolm? Like that, I mean, that seems like a, a kind of an early on quick sour approach. Uh, so there's a pretty prominent Berliner uh, historian, uh, Franz, I'm going to say his name wrong, Schoenfeld. He was a VLB scientist, a fermentation scientist, and he has notes that he collected. A lot of the early work was done by him, and we're talking like early 1900s. Mm. So really, yeah, in the in the very beginning phases of understanding yeast and bacteria on a microscopic level, even. Yeah, they 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 weren't really. I mean, I, I don't. I'm assuming here. I don't think they knew exactly what they were doing, as far as like, oh, this is lactobacillus, and they just knew that this thing had then add add to this, you know, wort at this time, and then we hold until we get what we like. I think they probably knew it was souring because that's why they kept it, you know. So yeah. You know, there's another scientist, uh, I forget his first name. It's uh, F-R-A-N-C-K-E, Franke. Uh, it's called the Franke acidification method. You know, I mean, that's that's the way they did it. They had an unhopped, unboiled wort because they believed that not boiling preserved some aspect of the wort that made it more uh, receptive to souring. Huh. So they did that, and, you know, they held it until their desired you know, pH level, or I should say their sour level was uh, obtained. And then they would heat it up to, to kill it off. And then they would add their top fermented uh, housed yeast. And they were making these sour beers. It sounds like that were, I mean, it's, it's interesting because it seems like we, I mean, okay. 
when I first, what was about, probably about six or seven years ago, probably, you know, around the same time, I think a lot of us were learning about sour beers. I know that Mike was taught, Tonsmeyer was talking a lot about sour beers back then. Other than that, I think I heard maybe Jamil Zanishev reference uh, Flanders Red a few times. But uh, besides that, you know, I think we're all kind of sour beer virgins. Um, Not all of us, but I know I for sure was. And the concept of making a sour beer, like the idea of doing it to me was very, um, I felt very hesitant to get going on it. And to this day, I've only made four standard sour beers because it takes so long. I mean, the the idea was that you 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 had to, ferment the beer out and then pitch your bugs and then let it sit for a year. And if you didn't like it, let it sit another year, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Um, and nowadays, I mean, um, I've had, I've had sour, quick sour beers that were made four weeks before I was drinking them that taste way better than the stuff that I made that took a whole year. I mean, I'm drinking one of them right now. Uh, so it's just really cool. Now, now, when it comes to, to quick souring, I know there's a, a gazillion methods, there's a gazillion theories, all of that stuff. Um, you had mentioned, Malcolm, something about uh, lactobacillus, was it Delbruckii or, or Brevis? or one? I know there's a bunch of those. So uh, Delbruckii was one of the ones that was ubiquitous from, I, I believe that was White Labs. And then uh, Buckneri was the one that was often found from Y yeast and huh. people had mixed results. And I think if people were doing the traditional, you know, add the, add the bacteria, your lactobacillus bacteria, along with your, a uh, sac, uh, sac from uh, strain of choice. I think people were getting the results they wanted. And I, I found that I get a lot of apple esters when I did that. I found it took too long. I had really poor uh, foam, on my beers, uh, they were oxidized, you know, cause it took so freaking long. Uh, the, the, the lactic acid inhibited, uh, some aspects of SAC, such as it didn't take off as fast. It didn't, it wasn't as robust. So a lot of my early, uh, quick sour beers, if you want to call them that, uh, you know, lacto sour beers, they, they weren't as good as I wanted. And I kind of gave up on the idea for a year or two until we started talking about these, uh, quicker turnaround beers. You know, that was probably like 2012 or 13, you know, I, I was at a competition and I, I, I had a uh, Goza and I had to look it up, you know, <laughs> yeah. it was like uh, in Cincinnati. And I, I look over in uh, Gordon's there and I say, what the hell is this? And he goes, oh, he had an idea of what it was, you know, uh, having wrote, helped write the style guidelines and stuff. And he was like, well, here, and he, he looked something up on his phone and I was like, well, I'm going to make one of these, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it was delicious. It was just a, a great, great balance, you know, and I, I was, I became hooked after that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sean, what's your typical thoughts on, on, on you know, one of the things that I've heard about quick sour, again, this is somebody who's done it twice, <laughs> who's done two kettle, I guess you'd call them kettle sours and only one of them was drinkable. Um, <laughs> um, what's your typical approach? Do you have a specific uh, a strain or species or whatever of lactobacillus that you prefer. Um, I know you do a lot of co-pitching with uh, Brett as well, or at least mixed fermentation, but you're turning them around quickly. I mean, I mean so, uh, you know, what's your go-to? Yeah, so uh, I would like to s- start off by saying I also was very intimidated by making sour beers. Uh, originally had uh, one or two bad experiences early on. I had you know, home brewing. I had left a sour beer, sour red in the bucket for like 11 months in the closet. It was just awful. Was vinegar, <laughs> vinegar. Yeah. <laughs> and Captain Crunch, which, you know, we might, might touch on, but, um, yeah, it was, it was awful. And I was like, Oh my gosh, you know, I can't <laughs> kind of like Malcolm. I kind of gave it up for a little bit and, uh, uh, came back to it a little bit later and, and, and got more, um, uh, passionate about it. But so some of the, some of the lacto strains I prefer, I, I like a blend of lactobacillus plantarum, which I think is one uh, home brewers are starting to talk about more uh, recently. I've certainly noticed that it, it seems to be the go to. I, I think because you can find it in like probiotics, it's what good be, it's what's in good belly, and a lot of people are using that as well. So, uh, it, uh, plantarum and brevis uh, have been uh, we've seen very positive results with a blend of those two. Uh, so the plantarum, I really appreciate because I feel, and I, I think this is what I've read as well. It's uh, backed up in my experience. It can sour quickly at a relatively cooler temperature. So, um, you know, I, I think I've used uh, Omega yeast blend, uh, the 605 plantarum brevis blend. Uh, we love that that combo. Um, and I think they, they gave a temperature range between 70 and 90 for its optimum temp- temperature range. 
And, uh, and I've really seen that I've pushed it down even, you know, 62, 65, and it's still a workhorse. It still creates acidity quickly. Hmm. Um, I personally will. So when I'm utilizing a quick souring method, uh, we don't kettle sour at house pen dragon, but we do, uh, essentially wort souring in the, in the fermenter is what we'll do. So on brew day, we'll knock out at about, you know, 90, 95, um, we might treat it. It really is going to depend. We have a few different methods. I can't give you exactly one method, but, um, you know, we might hit it with, uh, a little bit of lactic acid to bring that pH down. Um, so not, pre, pre acidification or so uh, here's how I, I look at lactic acid on brood a in my work. I look at it. I look at, uh, so we'll, you know, the end of the boil, your pH is somewhere around five, five, one, right? Right. right. And I want that pH lowered, not to create acidity perceptively, but to essentially give my lacto a head start and also inhibit anything else that might be, um, that might get in there and screw it up. So, um, I usually shoot for about 4.5 when I am adjusting the acidity. We don't always do that. Like, so on Genesis, the one we're drinking here, we did not adjust the acidity. Okay. Just pitch our house culture, Brett and Lacto, and it sours up quickly. And that's like a, that's like a a precautionary thing, right? You're like, Malcolm, I know that you've talked to me about pre-acidifying your wort before you go in with bugs. Uh, The purpose being to make it less, I guess, amenable to other, other things getting in there and really screwing up the batch. Yeah, there's there's two things, and I want to, I don't want to uh, interrupt Sean too much, but the the quick two things are one, you you steer the wort to a lower acidification, a lower acidity, a higher acidity, lower pH, to make it less uh, approachable or hospitable to undesirables, but you also inhibit uh, proteolytic enzymes to maintain foam production. So oh. if if you stay above uh, four five four six pH. You you have the potential for proteolytic enzymes to continue to degrade your foam positive proteins. Huh. So it, it's a two for one. That's interesting because sour beers, I know, just the acidity is known for not producing a, much of a foam, right? Well, uh, I, I think it's because we the production of, of uh, sour beers often creates a process in which you degrade a lot of the foam positive proteins. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So from what I understand, you know, if you, if you pitch your lacto in a wort, that's around five or 5.1 pH and that lactobacillus has a lot of work to go. If you want to go get down to three, four, three, three, you know, um, that lactobacillus, it, it, it can, as far as I understand, degrade proteins in the process. Um, so just like Malcolm is saying, yeah, it, it's, a uh, if it's working, if it's work, if it's working overtime from five or five, one pH down to three, three, four year, a lot of protein is going to be degraded at that point. Huh. So maybe that, I mean, that's obviously sounds like one explanation for why a lot of these sour beers just don't have very good head retention. Yeah. But the, the other thing there too, is, um, you're shortening that timeline, right? So from, so I don't, I don't pre-acidify anymore because I, I found that I don't have to, because, uh, I use probiotics a lot and I create a, a culture. So I'm going in with a pretty heavy uh, cell count of lacto. So I move, just the act of putting the starter in, which is full of lactic acid, lowers my work to like four, seven, four, eight. And then it only has to go, you know, 0.2 on the pH scale to, uh, if you want to call it, denaturing or deactivating those proteolytic enzymes. Right. So my, my timeline is condensed. Nice. And also by doing the, the pre-acidification, you're also condensing your timeline for between the time that you uh, you sour to the time you boil. You know, w- once that starts getting up into the 48-hour range, that's when I've started to find uh, isovaleric, which is cheesy, Parmesan cheese, and butyric acid, which is uh, from anaerobe bacteria. So a lot of times if you go to these places that aren't making, you know, these kick-ass quick sours like Pendragon is making – when you go there, usually it's because they had a long souring process. Right. right. I totally agree. And uh, I've got a hard and fast rule. I will never uh, let my lactobacillus go in the wort by itself for more than 48 hours. You know, if I'm at 48 hours and I haven't reached the pH that I am desiring, uh, which is very rare, especially with the blend that we're using, um, I will just go ahead and pitch my sack Brett combo or just sack or just Brett. 
Um, because any more than 48 hours, like Malcolm is saying, it, I think you're just putting yourself at too much of a risk. Um, you know, I wanted to touch on pre the pre-acidifying real quick too. The way I look at uh, pre-acidifying, uh, either lactic acid, phosphoric, whatever you're going to use, I look at that as kind of a catalyst to lower the activation energy of of that reaction. I know Malcolm, you're gonna t- you know what I'm talking about, I'm starting to geek out here, but you know that's that's the way I look at it. You know, you've got a hump to to get over to create acidity, uh, and, and your preacidification kind of lowers that that hump and it makes it a little bit easier for your lacto to get in there and tear it up. You guys go ahead yeah. and geek out while I enjoy this sour rye blonde that because um, <laughs> this is well, well, that's a neat way to put it because you you literally do if you add some acid, you knock out the uh, bu- the the pH buffering capacity of the wort, so you right. are quite literally. You're almost giving it a push, you know, because you, you've taken away that buffering ability. So now most of the souring is done by your active uh, uh, consumption of sugars by the lactic acid bacteria to create more lactic ions, lact- lactate ions. So, yeah, it's kind of a neat way to look at it. Now, my understanding is that to uh, I'm going to I, I, I'm going to be dead serious. I'm saying this to sound smart here. Uh, my understanding about lactobacillus is that it is heterofermentative, so it actually do, it will convert some sugar into alcohol. Is that true? Well, or? Okay. So, certain strains of lactobacillus are heterofermentative. Some are homofermentative. So homo- and that's okay. And that's okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, homofermentative, I, I believe, as far as I understand, uh, creates mainly or only lactic acid. <laughs> Marshall's dying over here. Um, uh, and then a heterofermentative strains will create, in addition to lactic acid, uh, some carbon dioxide, some ethyl alcohol, possibly a little bit of acetic acid. It, it might be ethyl alcohol or acetic acid, but very small amounts, of course. But yeah, those those are the those are I, I believe the main differences. Malcolm might know more than I do about that. No, that that's true. Uh, neat thing about plantarum, I, I believe I don't want to mix up plantarum with brevis, so. If a nerd's listening, please write in and tell me I'm stupid. I believe plantarum uh, can act as hetero or homo depending on uh, metabolites and uh, sugar sources. Huh. So it, it's it's kind of neat uh, in that regard. It can kind of switch. So, but but basically, though, you're not going to you know, for the for the for the novice sour beer brewer out there who's who's listening to this episode, hoping to get some tips on how to make a good sour beer quickly. You're not going to ferment your beer with lacto. Correct. Yeah. Okay. No, but if you are, that usually means you have a contamination. <laughs> yeah, some yeast wild yeast in there doing something, yeah. right? Well, yeah, your bugs are contaminated with yeast. Yeah. <laughs> and that happens. Uh, there was a pretty big uh, yeast manufacturer that had an ongoing problem with that. So yeah, there was. I, I believe I experienced that personally at the brewery. Actually. I think I experienced yeah, it personally yeah. at the home brewery, actually, but we'll, we'll keep our uh, mouths mum on that one. Yeah. So lactobacillus, you, you know, I, if you at 48 hours, uh, you should have pretty good uh, acidity. You know, keep that temperature range. It depends on your strain of lacto. Some you need to push a little bit higher, you know, 95 to 100. Um, like, like I've said, we keep it relatively low, you know, in the, in the mid 70s to maybe low 80s. But uh, if your gravity after 24, 48 hours has dropped more than about four or five gravity points, then you know something else is at work there and you really want to, take stock of what's going on, you know, taste it and, and see, you know, is this going in a bad direction and stop something before it, it goes in a really bad direction. And to stop that, I, I think what most people are doing is just bringing it up to pasteurization, pasteurization temperatures. Is that, or do you just dump it? I think if, if you're doing kettle souring, possibly, I don't have any experience doing kettle souring, so okay. I can't okay. speak to that. And kettle souring is just, it's kind of the more common, I mean, wort sou- I think kettle souring has come to euphemize kind of wort souring in general, but kettle souring is, is doing it in the kettle. Right, yeah, as, as far as I know, and, and Malcolm will probably know more about this than I do, but yeah, kettle souring is, you, you're acidifying your wort with lactobacillus, usually leaving it in the kettle. I know some people will transfer out to some other vessel and then back into their kettle but yeah they will they will get that wort acidic or to the level they want then boil off essentially killing whatever lacto strains anything else are in there locking that in that acidity where it is and then pitching either your sack or bread or a combination thereof i know it's really good for home brewers who don't have multiple sets of equipment to right. do kettle souring as opposed to souring in the fermenter and then you know running the risk of contamination later but uh, so I know kettle souring can be good if, if you don't want to do two separate sets of equipment. Yeah, I know. Um, I mean, it's almost an ideal kettle souring is almost ideal for people who do brew in a bag because you can make the wort right on your burner or if you have an electric element, remove those grains, bring it up to 180 degrees 
which I believe is pasteurization. Like you're assured, you know, that there's no wild stuff in there at that point or bring it up to a boil. Some people do that. Drop it back down to about 110, pitch your lacto, let it roll for 48 hours and then bring it up to a boil to kill all that off. Rack it to a fermenter and just treat it like you would a normal beer. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah. That's a great, great synopsis. Yeah. And, uh, and it's what's really great for, like he said, you know, home brewers who don't want to contaminate their downstream equipment, but also for professional brewers. That's why it became, I think, so popular in the last yeah. uh, four or five years because cool. you can keep all the, the bacteria, the lactobacillus, in your kettle, which is going to be boiled anyways. And it's stainless. So, yeah. It's not like it's going to yeah. get stuck to the stainless, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, some people will change out some gaskets, like at, at the hose, you know, the knockout tubing. Um, you know, and some people will dis- will uh, disassemble their valve at their uh, knockout valve, but yeah, that's going to depend on the brewery how it's set up and everything. Yeah, well, we've done uh, we've done some experiments. I mean, there's a lot when it comes to kettle souring, as it is with almost every aspect of brewing. It seems uh, there's a little bit of controversy, a little bit of disagreement, I should say, on uh, certain aspects. We've done some experiments on these things, uh, and we're going to be getting into all of that as soon as we return from this quick break. Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supply is the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code. Code BrewPod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com and be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Founded in 1978 by brewing pioneer Charlie Papazian, the American Home Brewers Association is a division of the Brewers Association focused specifically on protecting and promoting the hobby of homebrewing. In addition to their work lobbying for the rights of homebrewers across the country, they're also the primary sponsor of Brewlosphy.com. By joining the AHA, not only are you supporting their cause, but you get a ton of benefits as well. Discounts at brewers across the U.S., early access to tickets for events like the Great American Beer Festival, and you get to attend HomebrewCon, the world's biggest gathering of homebrewers. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash AHA now to sign up to become a member. So Sean just poured me this very interesting beer. It is a sour red ale. Uh, I'm really interested to hear how you made this one. That has anise seed in it. Anise seed. Um, And my... Right off the bat, I'm not a fan of licorice, and I know that anise has a licorice flavor to it, but I love root beer, and I know root beer also has anise in it, and this doesn't taste like either licorice or root beer, but it's got, it's so, it's probably one of the more unique, um, like sour style beers I've had. What in the world's going on in this one? Okay, thank you. I'm glad you like it. Um, yeah, we really, this was an, an improvised beer, so. This is a sour, an American sour red. First of all, I want to say we don't call anything, you know, Flanders red or Lambic or anything. We totally stay away from that. We're trying to be totally 100% honest with what we're doing at the brewery. These beers are turned around quickly. And we look at that as kind of educating the public. Hey, you know, we, we turn this around in three or four weeks. You can do it too. Um, you know, we're not trying to emulate any classic styles and we're not naming our beers any of those styles. We're calling them American sour beers. We're embracing the word sour because 
That's what we think they are, and that's what we think people will understand when they go to order it. They see that word sour, they know what they're in there in for. But yeah, this beer is sour red. It's seven point one percent ABV. <laughs> Sorry. Oh God. <laughs> um, so it's seven point one percent, and uh, so during the acidification process, so brew day knocked out to about ninety five. Pitch my lacto culture. I had a la- uh, lacto brevis culture go in and let it ride for about 48 hours at around 80, maybe 75, 80 degrees. And at the end of that 48 hours, I took a, a gravity sample and pH, and pH was where I wanted, but my gravity had dropped almost 20 points. So know? basically, what we were talking about in the last section, last segment was. So, you know, I, I'm always like internalizing, you know, what did I do wrong? You know, uh, what did I do different this time? This was straight, uh, a fresh culture. Uh, uh, I didn't do anything different in my procedure, but I noticed that, okay, I, I know this gravity has dropped significantly and something else is going on in there. And I knew that also, not because it's just the gravity drop. There was a real kind of toba- tobacco, kind of smoky character in the in the aroma and flavor, and so I had originally planned on putting um, a tart cherry puree into this beer, but after that first forty eight hours, noticing the gravity drop, I actually considered dumping it right away because I was like, okay, I don't know where this is going. We don't kettle sour, so this beer is going to ride how it is. It's going in the ferm- It's already in the fermenter, and whatever is alive in this beer is going to stay alive into the finished project or pro, um, uh, result. So, uh, yeah, so I, I had, I came to a, a fork in the road. Do I dump this or do I let it ride? And so I knew at that point, tasting it and smelling it with that smokiness, the tobacco flavor that it was going to clash with the fruit. So I decided to go a different way and I was thinking, okay, what's going to go well with this tobacco character going on in here and it was actually kind of pleasant it was not band-aid it was not pool water was not chlorophenolic it was a very nice pleasant smokiness uh marl bro or camel <laughs> yeah. i prefer cigars bro okay that's right yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, it sounds like uh cherry tobacco it's like swish or sweet so, yeah. <laughs> so uh yeah Actually, uh, um, I love Rocky Patel cigars, so it actually reminded me of one of, one of their cigars, and I was like, wow, this smells great. What's going to complement this? I could let it ride, let it go by itself. I wanted to do something a little bit more special because this was going to be uh, presented for our fifth year anniversary, which I was recently. Um, so I decided to go with the anise or anise seed. And, uh, yeah, at the just end, pick one and keep saying it, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be an anus. <laughs> anus. Yeah, no, sorry. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it, they seem to complement each other pretty well and, and people are pretty happy with it. It's got a nice red or a black licorice flavor, but it's got dark fruit characteristics that I believe uh, are coming from our Brett, um, as well as maybe the lactobacillus. So it's got this dark fruit character along with the uh, with the licorice, and and uh, I was hoping it wasn't going to be too overpowering, but um, people seem to like it. Yeah, it's definitely not good and plenty. It is, yeah. but it is. It's I get the dark fruit. I get I almost get a cherry. You didn't add the cherry, correct? But I get like a dark, like a like a almost like a um, dried cherry, you know, um, plummy type of thing going on. It's interesting you say that because um, very early on uh, when I was releasing some of my very small batch beers, I mean, in the beginning, I was doing half barrel batches, you know, as, as experiments. And we had released a beer and people were asking, hey, you know, is this barrel aged? No, absolutely not. There's 100 percent stainless steel, quick turnaround, sour beer. And they're like, OK, cool. Uh, next release was a sour red and, uh, went out to the tap room to see how people were enjoying it. And some people who I trust, who I, I know have great palates, they're like, Oh, finally you, you put one in barrels and you put fruit in it. And I was like, no, <laughs> no, it doesn't have any of that. Fooled you. Um, <laughs> you know, and we're not trying to fool people. You know, we want to be honest about, about it, you know? And I was like, no, I, I turned this around about three and a half weeks and they're like, I could swear there is, there's some kind of fruit cherry in here. Yeah. I think it's, it's a blend of, of our, our Brett strains and, uh, and our lacto kind of, uh, pertaining, uh, pr- producing those esters yeah yeah i'm slurring just as much as you are at this point so um, pie cherry right pie cherry is a, a traditional uh output of brett uh brooks right i think so that's what i've read yeah brooks alensis yeah. does the as, uh, as far as i understand yes yeah well we've uh i think probably one of the more well, speaking specifically of quick sours i think probably the most popular um or at least well known and maybe one of the first you know sour beers that a lot of newer brewers might be dabbling in is berliner weiss 
Um, Malcolm, I know you've made a ton of Berliner Weiss. I'll talk a little bit about my single experience <laughs> in a bit. But uh, when it comes to making quick sours, there's a few kind of like, you know, I mentioned it in the last segment. Um, a few, th- a few kind of rules that, that we've come to question. I think that a lot of quick sour brewers come to question. One of them being uh, whether or not a boil is necessary when making quick sour beers. Yeah. And so if people dabble in like shut up about Barclay Perkins or even even read that that VLB uh, PDF I just mentioned from uh, Marshall and, and Meyer, it talks about how especially in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, no boil was like the go to method. And uh, they believe that was to keep it light in color and to preserve that fresh doughiness that was uh, kind of a hallmark of, in, of the style and desired characteristic. But one of the things they don't talk about is that decoction mashing was also very popular back then. <laughs> so, you know, what happens is people are no boiling these beers. And, uh, well, we can get into the results in a second, but uh, there's a very, uh, very big risk by not boiling. Well, uh, you got people who are no boiling beers that aren't being decocted, right? Yeah. And, and any other number of sins, like, you know, uh, uh, Sean and I talked about pre-acidification, right? So I don't pre-acidify anymore, but I have my process down, you know, pretty dialed in, you know, I, I can turn a, a quick sour type beer, if you want to call it a Berliner uh, style beer or, you know, blender inspired, whatever, but I can make those beers in like five to nine days. No problem. P- probably five. No problem at all. But, you know, I do it a lot. I, I have my culture down. I I know I use Brevis and Plantarum much like Sean does. You know, it, it's routine, but doing things like boiling, that's not boiling. I mean, that's like pro level, <laughs> you know, that, that's like taking your video game and putting out an expert, uh, you know, <laughs> same thing with pre-acidifying. It covers up some, some weaknesses in your process. It does, you know, it make the work inhospitable to more things and it does reduce your timeline. So essentially we, we had an experiment where I decided I was going to boil, not boil one, uh, and, and boil the other. And so this I was made, now the boil, the boiling comes post acidification comes post souring process. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't want to belabor the the process too much, but essentially I made you know like eleven gallons of, of this, and so I I mashed, I, I didn't decoct, uh, and at the point in which I started racking off the wort, I diverted it into two different, uh, yeah, two different. Um, no, I, th- I think I actually put it into one boil. So I, I had eleven gallons, and I soured that eleven gallons soured with Ultimate Flora probiotics, and then. When it came time to heat it up, when it came time to heat it up, you either boil it or you don't. So I decided to not boil part of it, just let it go, cool it down a little bit further and add sack. And then the other half I boiled after the, uh, after the bacteria portion. So mash 11 gallons, cool to like 90, 95, add my probiotic come back like 18 hours, 12, 18 hours later, it's around 3.4 ish, 3.3. Then you would heat half of it to uh, kill the bacteria or, you know, the lacto or you don't. And some people really like the idea of leaving the bacteria in the work because it adds nuance and it continues to create metabolites, you know, uh, it's good for your gut as well. Apparently. I mean, that's the, that's the rumor. That's the rumor. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm not sure how scientifically uh, valid that is. They sell capsules, it makes people man, feel, you know. It makes people feel good, I'll tell you That's that. right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it might be true. Uh, so, yeah, so I thought I would do one this way, see if it does preserve that doughiness, and see if it does uh, create, you know, a, a different beer. And uh, lo and behold, I, I, I served it to, I think I had a pretty good amount for this experiment. I had uh, 30, 37, percent, 37, 37 people, yeah. And uh, usually when things are significant, you know, you take the one third for chance and then you add a couple and you're like, yay, we're significant. But, uh, and this one was a landslide. <laughs> 30, 31 people were able to reliably distinguish the boiled Berliner Weiss versus the non-boiled Berliner Weiss. That means six people probably had a cold or allergies or the typical <laughs> responses we get. Yeah. From, but, but only yeah. 18 people needed to get it right for us to say it was significant. And 31 out of 37 people got it. I mean, these beers were, I think we can say with confidence, they were obviously different. Um, oh, but but here's my favorite part. Yeah. Your least favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, uh, Sean, I, I don't know if you read this experiment or if you, if you read it le- recently, but uh, how do you think the preference was on these? Uh, I, I believe, uh, you know what? I can't, I can't remember what the preference was, but well, good. Yeah. What would you guess? <laughs> my, my guess would be, my guess would be the boiled one, but I, I really don't know. 15 but, preferred the boiled 13 liked the no boil. Okay. And this is, now, this is the only thing I like about preference, which last week, Malcolm, you and I talked about in the show that we recorded, uh, the fact that preference is entirely subjective when it comes to so many things. Um, almost more meaningful is is your biased impressions, Malcolm. What did you think of these beers? How did you taste them? I thought the no boil was a sin against humanity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to serve these. I, I was like, to me, it just tasted like bad startup brewer Berliner, you know, like uh, the guy who who won a homebrew contest, got a third in, in a flight of nine. He was like, "I'm going to be a brewer," and then he, he makes a Berliner Weiss, and it tastes like feet, cheese, and uh, like vomit. I mean, it was just it had all of that going on. Yeah, yeah. it was and just yet bad. Thirteen man. people liked uh, it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> interesting. It's crazy, yeah. dude. Yeah, I mean, God, and, and that yeah. that really is what I would expect. Yeah, I mean, uh, like like he's saying, isovaleric acid, butyric acid, creating bacteria. All, a lot of those are driven off in the boil. A lot of compounds are driven off in the boil. So this to me is not that uh, surprising. Yeah. I just want to, I just want to make sure people realize like there wasn't really like a lot of butyric and if it had a lot of butyric, I would have questioned the, the, uh, the safety, safety of the, uh, of, of the beer. So it, it just tasted funky, you know, I didn't have it, you know, chromatographed or, or anything. So, you know, I don't, fully know but meanwhile four um, homebrewers died in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah it was a sad day <laughs> it was a sad day in homebrewing but, but well, they finished uh, the results and finished out the uh so so <laughs> sean have you ever done like a no boil i mean you guys are boiling everything i imagine yeah yeah, yeah I, I have not uh experimented with no boil uh boiling to me is cheap insurance um you know and, and it ensures that i am starting with a very clean slate once right. my lactobacillus culture goes into that word uh, I, I have a good idea of, of what exactly is in there. So, you know, uh, uh, I talked to a lot of homebrewers. They're like, 180, it's totally fine. It's totally fine. Uh, that has not been my experience. Like Malcolm is saying, the no-boil beers that I've tasted, I, I have not personally enjoyed. I know some people some people do, and that's fine. But I have not enjoyed them. And uh, to me, it's cheap insurance to start with a clean slate. Yeah. I mean, well, I yeah, love cheese. Yeah. So uh, now, yeah. you know, I don't know if I love... I know I don't love the taste of butyric. I've had three children. Um. <laughs> so, but the cheese yeah. he's talking about from isovaleric acid is, is I believe, and Malcolm, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but it, it's, it, it's derived from a compound called leucine. Uh, yes. And yes. then, and, and it essentially creates the same cheesiness as your stinky feet or, you know, oh, when you yep. get some, that's pr- not cheese. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So when you, when you get some nasty funk going on between your toes, that's kind of more the cheese yeah. we're talking about. It's not good cheese. Gross. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, uh, it quite literally tastes like it's the same reaction, the same bacteria eating the same proteins that are in your fingernails and skin. So it's leucine and, uh, it smells like feet to me, you know, and Gross. that's one of the things I, but the big difference is, is when people were doing these no boils, you know, it, it's pretty well documented, uh, now and, and more available, you know, from the interweb searches is that, you know, back then they were, they were doing decoctions. It seems most everyone was doing decoction, you know, at least, at least one form of a decoction for a mash out or something. Another, uh, another thing that is often talked about. This is something that I was a big believer in, actually, um, only because I was, you know, under researched, I suppose. But is that when you're doing the souring? So, you know, again, we were talking about kettle souring, but really, we're. Well, I think that again, that's come to kind of euphemize this idea of quick souring, whatever it is. Not necessarily that it has to be in a kettle, um, but but souring the wort before you ferment it. Um, one of the one of the things that I used to hear a lot about, and this was a big concern of mine uh, on the single attempt that I've had doing this is that when you're doing the souring, you need to somehow shield your wort from oxygen, from exposure to oxygen. Is that? uh... So that is something I have heard. Uh, That is something we have implemented at the brewery. Not always though. You know, we've, we've kind of experimented. So we have, uh, we have blanketed some of, uh, of our worts with CO2. Uh, and others we just kind of let ride, uh, you know, and 
have experimented from there. Well, uh, Malcolm, what do you do? Are you, I mean... So, when I used to do sour mashing, so my first versions of, of some of these sour beers were sour mashing. I used to take a portion, uh, like maybe like a gallon or two, and sour mash it to the side. And every time I didn't preclude oxygen, I got some funky stuff. And so, this might have just been complete chance or anecdotal. So, I was a believer in it. But as I started getting into more robust cultures, uh, using like the probiotics or yogurt and, and various other, like I like Omega's uh, pitch, you know, they have like their lacto blend. When I started using that, you know, I started getting curious about whether or not it mattered and it, it just didn't seem to, you know, and uh, quite funny enough is in some cases we were just talking about butyric acid. Well, the, uh, the bacteria that, that create butyric acid tend to, or I think they always are anaerobic. So you might actually shift the scale to favor you know, if you do have any of those bacteria through your process, right? You I actually tip the scale to favor butyric acid production. <laughs> you know, so it's like, you know, you think you're doing the right thing, but it also does preclude some of the bacteria that create like isovaleric and, and other off flavors. So you, you just shift, you know, which which one you're favoring. Yeah, but exactly. What I've found is that if you don't do, if you just loosely cover, you know, you're fine. Especially if you have a good, healthy lacto pitch. You know, very, very true if you're using a commercial pitch and seemingly still true if you're using uh, probiotics, which, you know, aren't going to be made to the same standard as a commercial pitch. You know, they're not they're not thinking this is going to go into a, a beverage. You know, they're thinking it's going to go right to your gut. Yeah, right. You know, so, well, so really, the probiotic should be a dirtier lacto, but it, it, it still works, you know, without the uh, without purging with CO2 and oxygen mitigation right right well we were i mean if, if for people who read brewlosophy.com who keep up with the experiments we're up to just last week we um we published an article and i'm going to come in with a little disclaimer we're actually recording this before the article was published so uh, <gasps> date i know can you believe it we actually do these things ahead of time and pretend like you know whatever but um but but jason cipriani um did an experiment on the impact of oxygen during kettle souring um to test this whole thing out he's actually collecting data for that right now um but we're going to talk about it because i find the the, the results that he's already got are fascinating uh, basically, what he did uh, is he is he made up uh, two batches of the same exact wort um, using his grandfather system. So there, you know, everything is very well controlled in those. Um, and then in one, he he transferred both of those worts to kegs. And then in one of them, he just put foil over the top of the opening of the keg. And the other one, he sealed up, put gas on it, and so that no oxygen could come in. So he purged it put gas on it and I think he left 10 PSI of gas on it something like that just to make sure that no oxygen ingress was happening whatsoever uh, pitched his uh, he, he used good belly the mango one which I've heard doesn't actually impart any flavor because you're not using enough to, for it to impart flavor but man these beers Sean you're getting me um, <laughs> and then he let those things go he said it was one of the he's never used good belly he said it was one of the longest souring um, periods he's had to do I think it was like three days or, or what do we say like 80 hours something like that so not too bad uh, but I believe that's plantarum that's lactobacillus plantarum mostly um, he let these things go and then and then went to boil them after that and it, it's funny because <laughs> I remember when he was boiling them he was talking to our the the group of contributors and he was saying, dude, this open, the open soured one smells horrendous. And it was making his how he boils inside in the grandfather. So his, you know, his wife and kids are around and he, he was like, it smells so bad. It, it, a lingering stench. Uh, the, the non-open one didn't smell bad at all. So he was, he was prepared for the worst, right? And, and well, and, and at the very least for maybe a significant result, um, again, he wasn't, you know, what we're talking about now is before we actually publish the article, but we're pretty certain in the way this one's going to go at the point at the time of the recording of this podcast, he had uh, administered the triangle test to 12 participants. All right. At 12 participants, which is a very small sample size, we understand that eight people would have to have correctly identified the unique sample in the triangle test to get it right. And for us to say that it was significant. Only one person had, which is almost against random chance, but that happens. You see that happen. People are going to pick, you know, when, when everything is the same, tastes the same, people are going to pick things maybe based on order or their favorite color or because we serve these in colored cups. Um, yeah. So, so, I mean, this was so strongly, obviously not significant. 
that it was almost surprising. Uh, Jason said that even in his own tasting of these beers, he was unable to identify them. He randomly guessed in, I believe it was two out of five triangle test attempts that he did himself, he got right, which is just, again, just chance. If he had done one more, he probably would have got it wrong. Um, so it, I guess it's not terribly surprising because of this this idea that it's a facultative anaerobe and, and it... Uh, but to me, it kind of was because I, I hadn't really known this. Uh, so what say you guys? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it, it's it's a common thought in a lot of home brewers and a lot of pro brewers. Even, you know, we have to get as much CO2 in, in this beer as possible to protect it. So, you know, whether that's keeping a blanket on top uh, of the wort um, of CO2 or bubbling CO2 through the actual wort while it's souring. Um, but like Malcolm mentioned earlier, there are some strains of bacteria, I believe clostridium, uh, a certain strain of that is actually stimulated by carbon dioxide. So, (laughs) and that's a butyric acid creating bacteria. So like Malcolm was saying, you, you could be, uh, inhibiting certain bacteria and stimulating others. So it's really understanding your bacteria and lactobacillus, uh, like you mentioned, facultative anaerobe can use oxygen or, you know, or may not use oxygen is not really affected by oxygen as far as I understand. And, um, so the results of this uh, experiment are not very surprising to me at all. Malcolm. Yeah, no, not at all. You know, funny enough, I, some, some paper rattling here for effect. I have some nerd notes here. And, uh, so from 1978 and 79, there was a three brewery, uh, like, research done you have three different produ- producers of uh berliner type beers and two of them at the time were open fermented so uh, they're just listed as brewery one two and three i think you can go online and find it uh and, and the vlb and i think a, a similar uh chart can be found on shut up about barclay uh, barclay perkins so yeah two of the two of the larger Berliner Weiss producing uh, breweries back in the late seventies were using open fermenters, anyways. You know, and are those were those German breweries? Or? Oh yeah, yeah. Th- these are this is, uh, yeah. This these are German brewers you huh. know, uh, in Berlin. So a bunch of long German looking words that I can't pronounce properly. So, uh, so but, I don't I don't have it in front of me right now. So I don't I don't remember names or anything like that. But I I you know um, I think you know for better or for worse one of my One of my things is trying to figure out where, especially false, but rumors in general came from, because it seemed to me like this idea that 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 souring, even with lactobacillus, um, I mean, everything I was reading was like cover the top of your wort with saran wrap. And yeah, and I did that, you know, I mean, that was it was like I was scared that it was going to turn into this Parmesan mess. Um, but I was reading the milk, the funk wiki recently, and I forget who it was, but somebody commented on how a beer that they made that was fermented or soured open ended up having kind of an isovaleric, you know, thing going on. Um, and I wonder to what extent that is what influenced kind of the broader understanding when, when, when sour beer, especially quick souring was, was relatively young, uh, in this day and age. Yeah, you know, rumors like that happen on a on an influential site. I'm not sure if it was them, but I, I don't think it was Milk the Funk actually, yeah. Malcolm. I think I, I they, they were referencing where that yeah, came exactly. from. Yeah, exactly. That's well. what I'm saying. Yeah. So so but because they have a good platform, people read it and it just kind of spreads like wildfire. Right. Um or you know, some other other uh, web forms or, or stuff. So when I was sour mashing way back, you know, this is like, you know, 2008 and 9, you know, I was told, yeah, cover it, preclude oxygen, you know? I mean, that's what I was, it was just kind of like a, you know, rumor mill. It's what you did, you know, and I, didn't, I wasn't researching bacteria as much then either. So I didn't fully understand what I was doing. You know, I, I've, I remember anaerobe and, and aerobic, you know, I'm like, okay, I know what those terms mean, you know, <laughs> okay, you know, stop uh, oxygen from getting to these bacteria. Right. That, that's about as far as I took it, you know? Well, I think, you know, you know from these results um, and based on obviously what you guys are talking about, who are far more expert on this stuff than I am, uh, 
it sounds like it, like the worry of keeping a blanket of CO2 over your wort or covering it with saran wrap, which is a pain in the ass, by the way. Yeah. It is not as easy as it sounds. Um, it maybe it doesn't may not, sound easy. It's not easy, dude. Yeah. And it looks gross. It looks like skin, like, you know, like it's the top awful. of pudding or whatever. Anyways, uh, it's, it's probably not necessary. I, I plan on making a Berliner Weiss very soon for an experiment, an upcoming experiment. I won't be covering uh, the wort with that. Uh, Malcolm, one of the th- you, you've mentioned sour mashing now a couple of times. That's something I've never done. Sean, I don't know if you've done sour mashing before. Or... I have no experience sour mashing. Yeah, either. so maybe uh, that I, I suppose that would be another form of quick souring. Maybe you can run down real quick what sour mashing is. Then I'd like to get into uh, you know the, the the person who's listening now who might want to do their first quick sour beer. Like step one, starting with wort production and all of that, all the way through that. So Malcolm, sour mashing. What's up with that? So instead of using a commercial pitch, which some lab grows up, you know, a specific strain or blend of strains, instead of using probiotics, uh, you know, in a capsule form, or instead of using yogurt, which has probiotics in it, you're basically taking or making use of lactobacillus that's resonant on the grain hull, you know. So you mash your beer to convert, you know, your starches to sugars, blah, blah, blah. And then at the end, you can lower your temperature down to you know, 110, 95, whatever, you can just literally take a couple of handfuls of grain and just throw it in there. And just unmilled gonna, grain? Un, you, can, you can mill it if you want, but unmilled because you're just really trying to make use of the surface bacteria. Right. Because lactobacillus is everywhere. And it's everywhere. That's why sauerkraut work, kefir works, kimchi. It makes use of primarily LAB, lactic acid bacteria, and a few other, you know, leuconostock and, and et cetera. But, uh, Enterobacter, <laughs> but you know there's a bunch of stuff. There's bacteria all over everything, and luckily for us, lactobacillus tends to be uh, aggressive. It's very fast acting, and it produces a pleasant lemony tart acid. So you just take a handful of grain at the proper temperature. You throw it in your mash. Uh, if you want, you can drain your wort off first into another into another bucket to hold temperature, like a cooler. Hold it at like 90, 95, up to 100, and you can take your lactobacillus or your grain put it in a sack and then hold it in there you know tape it tape it to the side or whatever and then you should have the same effect but because you're not putting in quite as much and you're not putting in a known cell count there's some variables going on here but there's one or two breweries here in pittsburgh that make most of their are as far as i know all of their sour beers that way and that brewer thinks it's a, a more nuanced complex sour and I don't know if that's true. Uh, some of the sour mashes I made were definitely had a lot of character to them. And sometimes that wasn't a good character. <laughs> yeah. So I have a friend here in town. In fact, it's a friend of both of ours, uh, Chris Steinkraus, who I, I think he went to make a Kentucky Common or something like that one time. This is like six, five, six years ago. Yeah. And uh, I mean, he was he was the advocate for do not try sour mashing. It will ruin your mash ton. It smells terrible. It just yeah. doesn't work. Um, so I, that's, I'll admit that's part of the reason I haven't tried it. Um, one thing that I have done though, uh, and it's kind of, well, you know, I did try to culture some yeast from my front yard during a 110 degree summer day one time. And, um, I think, I think Sean had the pleasure of trying that weird beer. It, it was awful. <laughs> it was awful. <laughs> Surprisingly, no bottle bombs. I, I it made like a one gallon batch and I bottled them up and, and just to see what would happen. It was nasty. I got fermentation. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Uh, and it, and it actually ended up attenuating down to a normal finishing gravity, which I thought was interesting. But, um, yeah, the one time, the one Berliner Weiss that I made, uh, that really worked out. Um, I just made a typical 50, 50, I think it was Pilsner and uh, wheat blend wort, which is, you know, I think it was 1032 OG, something like that, nice and low. And then I kept, I, I, I threw a bag, uh, I think it was like six ounces of pale malt, um, you can read about this on the site. Just just search Berliner Weiss. But I, I, I threw in some malt, and, and uncrushed, in a bag and tossed it in there. And then I covered it with, you know, saran wrap. And I let it go until it tasted sour enough for me. And then I also checked the the pH. And I think it was, I think I dropped it down to like 3.3 3 or 3.4 3 pH. And then um, brought it up to a boil and pitched, I believe it was a Kolsch strain. Um, WLP029, if I'm not mistaken, and fermented it out and kegged it up. And it was 
Really quite good. I you tasted this as well. We actually did a comparison, Sean, with um with Matt Human, another local home brewer here in town, friend of ours, who had a similar Berliner Weiss that I that was a bit more tart and way more clear than mine, but I also think it was a little bit older. I think we voted his was better, but still his was his was fermented with a culture, but I did mine using the whole, you know, uh, the, the grain, the grain method. And I think it worked out fairly well. Yeah, I thought it was fantastic. And uh, it, it, I think we had all decided the other one, Matt's was more sour, more aggressively acidic. Yours was the crushable one. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it had more, it definitely was more complex. Right. Um, whereas... You know, I've, and, and I've had other Berliner Weisses that have, that were soured with like pure cultures, and you know, unless you're unless you're tossing in some Brett for fun, uh, there's a tendency for those to be kind of unidimensional, but in a good way, you know, in a, in a really good way. I think I think um, I think Matt's also had higher alcohol than mine did as well, but uh, but it definitely worked out, and I and that beer turned I turned that beer around in ten days, easy, you know. So yeah, no, I used to use like say I do one or two gallons, and I would do. The, on the side of the beer. So I would divert like a gallon or so of wort and sour it separately. And that way, if it didn't come out, I was only out one gallon and I could just dump it. Yeah. It was actually a pretty neat way to do it. And then if it did come out, you know, I would add it to the beer just to bring the tartness up. So I used to do it for whipped beer a lot, you know, make like a, a slightly tart whipped beer, which was really popular in the summer, you know, just for picnics and stuff. Totally. And uh, the ones that came out good, they were just amazing. I mean, they were, they had like this, bright lemony tartness and yeah you know you know things that i i would not attribute to that method now but it had like a doughiness and it had a graininess to it that i just really really loved so and something about the romance of the process you know i really like the fact that this lacto came from this grain i'm doing it in kind of an odd way that was part of the enjoyment for me for sure for sure well I, okay so i know there's a lot of people out there listening right now who want to know how are, how can we make our first sour beer and be ensured it's going to be drinkable and not be a tosser? I, that was my big fear. I mean, and, and I'll admit, you know, I, I, I mean, the main reason I don't do a lot of sour beers is because I've got my, my calendar for experimental beers is so, so long, but, uh, I, I can, I can relate with that fear of not wanting to have to dump, you know, five to 10 gallons of beer. Um, Maybe you guys can share with us, like like start to finish, what we can do. Are there specific grains you absolutely do not want to use if you're making a sour beer? My understanding, at least in terms of wort production, is any wort can be turned into a sour beer with this quick souring method. Um, but but maybe we can talk a little bit about how you know here here's a good way to get that process down, make your first sour beer, and have it turn out really well. For a very simple, traditional, traditionally influenced Berliner or Goza. I would go with like 50% wheat or higher, you know, up to 60, 70% wheat and the rest, a uh, continental Pilsner. And, uh, that's it. It'll be very, very, very light, nice straw color with a, a little haze. And, uh, I, I like the way it looks. So, and, and those, you, you can turn that around in how long? Oh, like, like I said, if you, if once you get it dialed in and you're good at it and you do like a, uh, I'll use gravity points, but like a 1032 to like 1040 something low forties, uh, original gravity, you can finish that beer in five to seven, nine days if you're if you're slow. And oh, that's if you're kegging, um, and yeah. and, and force carbonating, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Right, yeah. and and those beers, and we're talking like it's in its prime five to seven days after you. Brew yeah, it. well, so much like Sean, I like to add a little Brett to the keg, but we can talk about that in a second. Basically, at least fifty up to seventy percent wheat, and then the rest continental pills. No hops. You add no hops. You add no hops. <laughs> or one pellet. Some people just, it's, got, it's not beer unless you add at least a you single can take, pellet of hops. You could take a pellet, face it towards the kettle, and then throw it away. <laughs> Blow over your hand. Yeah. yeah. You add no hops until you go to boil it, if you want hops then. Um, some people will tell you differently. There's some strains that are more hop tolerant. But why? Why are you doing that? You know, just don't do any hops. You know, uh, some of these strains are, are pretty IBU sensitive. So, uh Mash, mash, uh, I go low on these because I like them to be dry. So I do a long hour to 90 minute mash. And uh, I aim like 1035-ish uh, original gravity. And uh, mash for, like I said, 60 to 90. And then louder as, as normal, pull it aside into my boil kettle. 
and then I heat it up. So I heat before the process because I like to make sure I'm starting from a clean slate. Sure. So I, I heat it up. You can boil for a couple minutes if you want to. Nice opportunity to gravity correct if you got too low or whatever, too high, you can add some water. But uh, heat it up to at least 190 and then preferably boil it for a little bit. Then cool it down to whatever your strain suggests. So if you're using a commercial strain, listen to what they tell you. Uh, you know, buyer beware. So I use probiotics and I use plantarum. As Sean said earlier, plantarum will sour at room temperature. It works faster, like most biological reactions, at warmer temperature. So somewhere around 90, 95, I hold, I, I'll, I'll bring the wort down to like 95, add my probiotics, and then cover it. There's enough thermal mass there, or you can wrap it with some insulation. It'll be plenty. So I usually do this at night. I do this at night, and then I come back the next day after work, and it's it's down, assuming my uh, assuming my post mini boil pH is like five two five one. By the time I come home the next day, after work, it's like around three three. So almost speaking always. of speaking of pH, I think that's that's something. A lot of people are going to wonder if they need to have a pH meter for this. No. Um, you, you said no. You, you go off of taste, right? Yeah. So a pH meter is neat because you can kind of. Learn the process. You can kind of see the process. It lets you know how things are working. So it's good for fine-tuning and honing your process. But if you have good bacteria and you, you know, are relatively clean, like, you know, you, you, you do that mini boil beforehand and you pitch adequate amount of bacteria, your taste will tell you. Now, it's going to be a bit confusing because you're going to have some uh, sugars. You have some sugar in that uh, wort, right? But it'll be it'll have a lemony tartness, you know, and yeah, I like to go to like three, 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 four. So that seems like it's kind yeah. of the sweet spot, though. If you are measuring like yeah. three, 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 four is kind of where I like it as well. Yeah. Typically. So well, that's why I like that's why I like the pH meter because I can go, OK, I'm there now. I'm not doing you know a different concept. We can talk about some other time, but I'm not doing uh, titratable acidity, which is the real measure of, of sourness, not pH. But uh it's it's a good indicator. It's it's like a a, a wind sock. You know. Sure. Okay, I'm at three four. That's pretty good. I can now add heat and stop the process. So now I add heat. I boil again, or you can just hold at one ninety. Whatever you prefer to do. I boil again for a couple minutes. Then I cool all the way. And now you can add hops. Now, hops are now allowed. <laughs> so, but not much still your, though, right? Like a lot of times, <laughs> hops can clash with. If I'm not mistaken, can kind of cla- kind of take away from what you're looking for in in the uh... well, the bitterness could definitely counteract the sourness. But in my experience, a little bit of noble hopping and especially Sterling. Sterling's awesome hop for Berliner uh, Aragoza. A little bit of Sterling has like a lemony floral, lemony taste to it, uh, aroma, I should say. Yeah, like ten IBUs. Like think think about it as a half of Eisen. You know, eight to ten IBUs is plenty. Yeah, yeah. Sean, what's your uh, what's your like you know first time souring? I'm, these beers are getting me, dude. I'm going to admit it. So. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm a big fan of just you know sour blonde base. So a lot of uh, sour beer I make at the brewery is just a really nice you know five or five and a half percent sour blonde base. So I'm going to use somewhere around seventy five percent pills, you know maybe fifteen percent. Uh, yeah you know, white weed or something like that, maybe a little spelt in there. Um, keep it nice and simple. Um, for the sour reds that I do, and, you know, people talk about the cherry be- uh, flavor in our in our sour reds. Uh, I'm a big fan of, um, of a Special B. Huh. So, yeah, in our reds, I will, uh, I'll do, you know, mostly uh, Pills malt base, toss in, you know, maybe... Maybe as high as like ten percent, twelve percent special B, and then finish off any color adjustments with a little bit of chocolate malt. Um, just like Malcolm is saying, I'm mashing very low, uh, one forty seven, one forty eight. I usually just go sixty minutes. If you want to go ninety minutes, that you know really uh, get a fermentable work going. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll mash uh, one forty seven, one forty eight. I will boil. Like I said, it's cheap insurance for me. Uh, I usually go at least a thirty minute boil. Um, at the end of that, if you are deciding to pre-acidify, I'll hit it with 
uh, a little bit of lactic acid to get that pH down to around four, five, four, six. And that's, you know, there's no real, no easy way to figure out exactly how much lactic acid to put in. Um, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be based on different variables like your wort volume, wort density, um, you know, I, I have a method for that, but it's long winded right. and <laughs> it, it's, it's, I, th- I think I put it in the, uh, my, my Berliner Weiss boil, no boil experiment. I think it's in the comments. Yeah. So I, I'll usually, j- you know, I'll whirlpool and then I'll hit it with some lactic acid and check the pH until I get down to where I'm good. So if you don't have a pH meter, maybe research what Malcolm, uh, has, has, has going there. But as far as hopping rates too, very, very low. Uh, I, I will hop it to less than five IBUs. So because we're not kettle souring, um, I got to get hops in there because we're pro brewery. So, you know, we got to have some hops in there. Where you, you can lie. They don't, they don't check it. We don't they don't the, check. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have the luxury of home, brewery, uh, home brewers to <laughs> not add uh, hops. Like So, yeah, you know, I'm counting out my pellets essentially, right, Marshall? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sean is known for being, he doesn't measure out his... Uh, <laughs> His uh, his 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 hops. He actually, well, he used to at the yeah. very least. I imagine you're not doing this in the professional you know, setting. I, I'm, I'm sprinkling in hops, like you know that <laughs> meme, the guy with the sunglasses is throwing salt on the meat. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That's me with a few hot pellets. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, he's not right. <laughs> so very very low IBU, un, under five, well under five IBUs. Uh, so yeah, thirty minute boil. I'll adjust pH if I if I'm going to. Sometimes we don't. I will not hit it with any oxygen at that point. But I'm chilling down to about ninety going into the fermenter and hitting it with my uh, with my lacto culture so at this point we have not uh, experimented with any pediococcus uh, so maybe that's a whole other topic but in pedio we've had some issues with diacetyl and Britannomyces takes a long time to metabolize that so I've been keeping pedio out of any beers that we've released because we've had an issue with with diacetyl a little bit of ropiness to the ex- yeah. exopolysaccharide production uh, and Britannomyces can Britannomyces can metabolize that, but it takes a while and we're looking to turn around in four to six weeks or sometimes less. So, uh, I'll go into the fermenter at about 90 degrees, hit it with my lactoculture. Uh, I'll come back at about 48 hours, sometimes less. It depends on, you know, when I'm at the brewery. Um, and then at that point I will hit it with some oxygen uh, and then I will pitch either my, uh, we're usually doing a blend of Saccharomyces and Britannomyces. Uh-huh. I will co-pitch the Sac and Brett at that point. Are there particular Sac and or Brett strains that either of you prefer that, that you think produce a better character? That's than, a good question. I, yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of, of Colchis because I, I think they're acid tolerant. One of my favorites though is uh 3711 from Y yeast. So it's it's a saison yeast, obviously, but in my experience, it's been very acid tolerant. It's highly attenuative, so it can go into that harsh environment of low pH and still kind of tear it up along with my Britannomyces. So yeah, that bre- is a robust yeast. If, I, yeah, yeah. yeah thirty seven eleven is my favorite for non traditional Berliner. I should try it for a Berliner actually, or a Goza. But that that is a beast yeast. Uh, it attenuates really nicely, and it's as it seems to be acid tolerant. So it appears that most yeast will will work, and I don't want it to be super characterful. So I've been using Kolsch a lot or a Euro Ale, but I've used Cal Ale, no problem. Uh, you know, I just pitch a little higher rate because you're you're putting it in kind of a hostile environment. But I've actually used some of the dry yeasts, and the dry yeasts are they're pretty robust. I mean, they've already gone through mummification and reanimation. You know, it's so it's already like the uh, Austin Powers of yeast, and it'll it'll go in in rip roar some of those yeasts just really seem to work really well i've used that k97 oh yeah from us uh, from Safil or whatever yeah that worked great and i used uh just traditional uso5 and that worked very very well as, yeah so uh, i'm a big fan of co-pitching sack and brett together uh after my worst wort is nice and and uh acidic i i I think I get layers of complexity pitching Sac and Brett together. So from what I understand, Britannomyces can produce a, t- a bit of acetic acid when it is in competition with other microbes. And so that brings up kind of a, a, an interesting point. Do I want acetic acid in my beer? Well, uh, yes and no. So in high levels, you're going to get some vinegar. Uh, in low levels... 
I believe I'm somewhat mimicking long-term barrel storage, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, somewhat yeah. micro oxidation. So I like that Brett to be stressed. I like it producing a, a slight amount of acetic acid, which I think complements it. So I think in our beers, a layers of acidity is what I'm going for. Uh, so I want, in addition to lactic acid, I want to sprinkle in just, you know, it, like salt, just be very careful with yeah. that. I want a slight amount of, uh, amount of acetic acid, you know, and if you're going to fruit it, you're going to get other layers of acid in there, tartaric acid, uh, citric acid, what else? So Malik, yeah. in addition to layering the acid, so I'm going for complexity, you know, you're turning around these beers relatively quick. How are you going to get uh complexity? Um, it, getting a little bit of that acetic acid in there. <laughs> this sounds crazy, but I will expose some of my beers to a little bit of oxygen as we go just to kind of cheat. I know it's, it's blasphemy. It's, really, it's playing with fire. I understand. <laughs> uh, I haven't, I haven't gone too far with one yet, but uh, I will expose some of them to oxygen just to kind of play around a little bit. Uh, but we've, we've noticed is our bigger batches. Um, you know, when we go up to five or 10 barrel batch, uh, they're a lot cleaner because we don't expose them to any oxygen. So yeah, yeah. They turn around quick, and it's just a real uh, nice, clean lactic acid note. But there's not a lot of complexity in there. I like to get those layers of acidity uh, in there. And in addition to to having those uh, other acids layer in, Britannomyces is is reacting with those acids and creating esters. So uh, in acetic acid, uh, it's turning acetic acid into uh, ethyl acetate. So ethyl ethyl acetate is something you want to avoid too in in higher levels because it's the nail polish remover and it's it's not pleasant at all and it's not going to go away after a while. But in very, very low levels, ethyl acetate can come across a little bit fruity, maybe pineapple. That has been my experience. So it turns... Uh, lactic acid and ethyl lactate, a little more fruitiness. So you're getting complexity as the Britannomyces interacts with these other acids. Even butyric acid in very, very low levels, Britannomyces is converting butyric acid into ethyl butyrate, which again can be kind of fruity. And it's all yeah, things. Ethyl you, butyrate is definitely is usually the pineapple in low levels, uh, and right, ethyl right. acetate will be uh, generic fruity, right. like uh, almost like juicy fruit gum. Right. So that's what I'm kind of going for. I'm, I'm trying, I'm shooting for complexity uh, and sometimes I'm playing with fire, but uh, you know, it's fun. Well, I've had, yeah. I've, I, I've had a ton of the uh, sour beers that I know are quick turnaround at House of Pendragon. Um, and I've yet, I'm not a big fan of strong acetic character like the Duchess, you know, I can't drink that. It tastes like malt vinegar to me. Um, I, when I drink, and this is, people are going to be like, oh, he's just saying that because he's his friend, but I'm really not. Sean knows me well, I'll be honest. He's saying it just because he's my friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the, the, um, y- y- the, the sour beers that you guys are, are turning around in a month, give or take, are almost equally as complex. I under, you know, one of the biggest, I think, contentions that people pose about quick souring is that they're unidimensional there. It's all lactic. It's all that lemony yeah. tart and you're done. And Malcolm, right? There's a lot of them that are really popular right now in multicolored cans. And they, to me, they taste like nothing but just pure, pure sourness. I mean, there's like no flavor. It's just. Yeah. Right, right, so so exactly. the argument is accurate. I mean, they, it's like, like they are, they're boring. Um, and unfortunately, Malcolm, you don't have the fortune of sitting here with us today drinking these beers. But they are—they that's have, like, because Sean did not send. He's a terrible <laughs> guy. I trust me. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna give him a licking you know, after the yeah. show's done. But but the but they are they like like you were saying, Sean. They they have a complexity. They um, it's not, and I think a lot of it has to do with you know the fact that you're blending in Britannomyces as well. I think a lot of people are afraid to play with that, and 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 understandably so. You know, Britannomyces isn't the kind of thing. You take lightly if you get a, a Brett infection in, or a diastaticus infection or something like that in your brewery, it could be a pain in the ass to get rid of. Um, but they're complex. I like that he's using Brett because I, I I actually package a lot of my uh, quote quick sours with Brett. I put them. Right, I have kegs that are marked with red tape that are my sour kegs, and when I put my quick sour beer, so my Berliner or Goza, whatever, they get packaged with usually a uh, Brett C or Brett B or a mix. Yeah, yeah, and that and that's you know. I think that that contributes a lot to the complexity that you guys get. The fact that you care so much about what you're doing and you're well studied, you're well uh, um, versed in this. The fact that I'm 
obviously a little drunk now that I've been drinking these beers. Um, thanks for coming on the Ma- show. Dude. Marshall and I are both uh, naked now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you weren't supposed to give our secret away, Sean. You know, I, yeah. w- I want to say uh, I, I really appreciate the, uh, the high praise, Marshall. Um, you know, I think one thing that we're trying to do locally is is uh, educate some of the local drinkers about, you know, sour beer and, and the, the different kind of flavors uh, that you can get. So, you know, our quick turnaround beers are one process, one procedure that we're utilizing. We're utilizing a few. Our barrel program uh, is, is getting up and running. We're in the infancy stages of that. Um, but we, so we're going to be providing a lot of different kinds of sour beer, uh, in really high volumes coming up. So we, we've actually upped the production from my really small pilot batches, like <laughs> literally half barrel batches up to, you know, now we've got a ton of like, you know, five, seven barrel Grundies that we've dedicated solely for, for sour beer, uh, production. So we're, we're really upping our volume and trying to, to really get some creative beers out, out to the local, uh, demographic. Well, you're killing it, and I appreciate you coming on the show and, uh, you know, uh, allowing our listeners to kind of hear what's going on in the Valley. I know that we kind of get a bad rap sometimes, and I'm cool with people hating on us, but uh, this is one thing they cannot hate about us because you're kicking ass. Um, If you are coming through the Valley, if if you're going from Northern California to the South or South to the North, take a little, you know, take 99. Don't stay on I-5 and stop off at House of Pendragon. These guys are doing killer things, not only with your guys' sour beers, but uh, the, I, the the millions of hazy IPAs that you guys have on tap all the time <laughs> and um, everything else you guys are doing. I really appreciate you being on. Thanks, man. Thank you. All right. If you guys want to read about anything that we talked about in this show, or at least some of the stuff we talked about in this show, or anything else we're up to, you can head over to brewlosophy.com. The Brewlosophy Podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors, as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy Podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it suits my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man no more. Life is good, the likelihood of me. Attention baker shoppers. This flu season, why make an extra stop when a world of care is right in store? Get your free flu vaccine from a licensed pharmacist at our award-winning pharmacy. Let our family protect your family with a free flu shot. It's all here. Bakers, a world of care is in store. Flu vaccines are covered by most insurance plans and are free to the recipient. Check with your plan. Services and availability vary by location. Age and other restrictions may apply. Visit the pharmacy or site for details.